Hello, this is Father John Brown again, and welcome back to the class, a series of classes uh, entitled The End Times Evangelicalism versus Orthodoxy. Uh, I serve at Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church, and uh, in the first of these classes, we looked at the origins and overview of dispensationalism. The origins, meaning when, when and where it came from, uh, the, what was going on at the time, and also the overview of the, the series of events that dispensationalists uh, see happening in the future. We compared it, contracted it, contrasted it with orthodoxy. So anyway, uh, this will be the third class. On this class, we will talk about the church and Israel, a uh, point of differences and many differences between evangelicalism, or I keep saying that, I should, I should be saying dispensationalism, uh, because again, not all evangelicals are dispensationalists. I'm basically talking about dispensationalism uh, versus orthodoxy. So in this class, we will look at the differences uh, between evangelicalism or ortho orthodoxy and dispensationalism and uh, the church and Israel, how the two groups view the church and Israel and the relationship between the two. Orthodoxy and dispensationalists have a very different idea about the relationship between the church and Israel. So that'll be the focus of this class. Nowhere is dispensationalism more strikingly different from orthodoxy and even from non-dispensational Protestants than their belief in a profound separation between the church and Israel. Lewis Berry Chafer, an, an early leading dispensationalist theologian, identified 24 differences between the two. In, uh, in his, in his uh, systematic theology. To dispensationalists, Israel was the first people of God before the church, and they will return and resume, to, resume their place after the church is raptured. Some dispensationalists appear to believe that this Israel-church distinction will continue all the way into eternity. Now, just as orthodoxy focuses on the essential unity of the Old and New Testaments, Orthodoxy also sees an essential unity between God's Old Testament people, Israel, and God's New Testament people, the church. Put another way, Israel is the church of the Old Testament, and the church is the Israel of the New Testament. To the Orthodox, the church is a final, eternal fulfillment of Israel, not a temporary parenthesis between two Israelite ages. You can see there on that picture, the top is a, is a Hebrew, a modern Jewish celebration of the Torah, and the, all Orthodox Christians would recognize uh, that second picture on the bottom showing the procession of the Epitaphion during Holy Week. Now, why is it that Orthodox believe that the church is the fulfillment of Israel? Number one, God has never distributed his grace based on DNA. It is true that God revealed himself most directly to the Israelite people. To them were given the patriarchs, the covenant, the law, the prophets, the tabernacle and temple, the priesthood, and above all, the promise of a coming Messiah. But merely becoming an Israelite did not make one close to God. For that, Israelites had to live their lives according to faith as expressed by works. Also, those born outside the Hebrew nation were never excluded from God's grace. The Old Testament shows many non-Israelites, such as Rahab, a Gentile who became an ancestor of Christ, who found favor with God because they, like righteous Israelites, lived their lives in faith as expressed by righteous works. The path to God has always been the same for all people, repentance, faith, and works. Being an Israelite and alone never saved one. The second reason the Orthodox Church believes that the church is the fulfillment of Israel is we begin with looking at the book of Romans. Through Paul is referring to the Israelites here, here, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. Uh, we would notice here that, that uh, Paul certainly believes that the Israelite, Israelites of his day were broken off. Their, uh, their 
they uh, no longer uh, were God's people of, of going from Old Testament to New Testament. And if they continued in belief, on unbelief, that's how they would remain. But they could be grafted in. It says here, they will be grafted in for God is able to graft them in again. Now, by insisting that Israelites and Christians are fundamentally separate people of God, it appears that the dispensationalists believe that Israel is not truly broken off, that they're still the people of God to a significant degree, and therefore do not need to be grafted in again to the church. And the Apostle Paul spent much of his life's ministry ministering and attempting to graft back in again uh, the Israelite uh, people. But they had to be grafted in. They had to be grafted in to the church. Number three, Paul writes in the book of Galatians, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. There is neither Jew nor Greek, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. By their insistence that the Israelites and Christians are fundamentally separate people of God, it appears that the dispensationalists believe that there is a difference between a Jew and everyone else in the eyes of God. Number four, Paul writes, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And he was writing to the church in Galatia, and that church was probably either up entirely or almost entirely Gentile. And he's basically saying to a group of Gentile Christians that they are in Christ, and because they are in Christ, they are Abraham's seed. They are the fulfillment of, of God's people uh, of the Old Testament now being fulfilled in them as Gentile Christians, and they are specifically called Abraham's seed. By insisting that Israelites and Christians are fundamentally separate people of God, it appears that the dispensationalists believe Christians are not Abraham's spiritual seed, as Orthodox do. Number five, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Now the Jews are historical, physical descendants of Abraham through his son Isaac. They also place great spiritual significance to this ancestry, that connection to Abraham by family, by race, by DNA is very important uh, to, to the Jewish people. The dispensationalists agree with the Jews that this physical ancestry uh, to Abraham is still of profound spiritual significance. But Paul says here that it is the Christians, not the Israelites, who are the true children of promise the new spiritual descendants of Abraham. By their insistence that Israelites and Christians are fundamentally separate people of God, it appears that the dispensationalists believe that Israelites are still the children of promise, the spiritual descendants of Abraham and not Christians. Number six, Paul writes in Ephesians, it is now, as it has now been revealed by this spirit to his, his holy prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. By their insistence that Israelites and Christians are fundamentally separate people of God, it appears that the dispensationalists believe that Jews and Gentiles are not fellow heirs of the same body, but of a different body. Number seven, <clears throat> the gospel of Matthew, Christ is speaking. <clears throat> and do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Christ is saying here that being a physical descendant of Abraham is no more significant than being a stone. By their insistence that the Israelites and the Christians are fundamentally separate people of God, it appears that the dispensationalists believe that being a physical descendant of Abraham is far more significant than being a stone. Number eight, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. The purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. By their insistence that Israelites and Christians are fundamentally 
separate people of God, it appears that the dispensationalists do not believe that Christ has made the two groups one or destroyed the barrier or the wall of hostility between Israelites and Christians. Number nine, Paul writes in Romans four, therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who, th those uh, uh, others, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who was the father of us all. Those who are of faith, meaning Christians, those who are of faith are of Abraham, whether they are Jewish or Gentile. Those who are of faith, the Christian faith, are now include, all included in all the seed of Abraham, not just the Israelite part. In fact, in verse 7, it says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. This is a quotation going all the way back to Genesis for this quote. In establishing his original cover, covenant with Abraham, inclusion, inclusion of the Gentiles, meaning of many nations, has been part of God's plan all along. Now we'll talk a little bit about God's covenants with his people. God's Old Testament covenants are very important to dispensationalists. They believe, and I'm quoting from a, a dispensationalist source here, a covenant is an agreement or contract between men or between men and God. Generally, it is based on certain conditions agreed upon. Sometimes, as between God and man, it is unconditional. God's covenants with man originate with him and generally consist of a promise based on the fulfillment of certain conditions. God has made eight covenants with man. They all relate to the earth. Each one introduces a new dispensation. Six, six of them were given to individual and representative men as Adam, Noah, and Abraham, and went into effect during their lives, except to the one given to David, which took effect at the birth of Jesus. So we see a total of eight covenants, covenants or eight, yes, eight covenants uh, put forth by dispensationalists. They identify eight covenants in the Bible. It's what they, and these are all their terminology. <clears throat> the Edenic covenant was with Adam and Eve before the fall in the Garden of Eden, where the name comes from. Number two is the Adamic covenant was with Adam. That's why it was called Adamic and the Eve after the fall. The third covenant is the Noahic covenant, which was with Noah after the flood. The fourth was the Abrahamic covenant, which was made with Abraham and his offspring. Number five is the Mosaic covenant, which was made with Moses. The sixth is the Palestinian covenant, which was made with Israel through Moses. The number seven is the Davidic covenant, which was made with David. And last, the eighth is the new covenant, which has not yet been made. Here's a summary of these eight different covenants as identified in dispensationalism. Uh, we've already named the first three. Those are the scripture passages. And in each, there's a, God, there's a promise, and some of them are conditional, and some of them are not. Uh, with Eden, uh, the Edenic covenant, God's promise that the children of Israel could, uh, that Adam and Eve would enjoy the blessings of the Garden of Eden, and their only condition was they were not allowed to eat of the forbidden fruit, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. If they failed, that resulted in the fall. Uh, the Adamic covenant in that, uh, which was after the fall, God foretold to Adam and Eve and all humanity that after that, now that they were fallen, they would have pain in childbirth, they would have to confront with thorns and thistles in order to earn their livelihoods, uh, and they, they received the promise of a savior. And that promise was unconditional uh, because the, pro the savior was promised and the savior has come. And that covenant is still in effect. Uh, then there's the Noahic covenant. In that covenant, God promised that he would never again destroy the earth again by water. And that was unconditional and that's also still in effect. Then is the Abrahamic covenant. Those are the three scripture passages. Uh, that collectively form the Ab Abrahamic covenant. And this is in some ways the, one of the more significant ones uh, to, to uh, uh, dispensationalists. God promised a lot of things to Abraham, things like, I will make you a great nation and your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. 
and they will be as numerous as the stars of the sky. I will give you this land, which he was referring, referring to Canaan. I will bless you through, you. through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed, and your name will be great, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And that is deemed to be unconditional. It's not like Abraham, at least in the view of dispensationalism, uh, there's no, it's not like the Garden of Eden where God says, I will just give you things if you do something. But these uh, appear to be in the Bible and are certainly understood by the dispensationalists to be an unconditional set of promises. They would, they would prevail no matter what Abraham did. Uh, then under the covenant of Moses, uh, that was focused on the giving of the law. Collectively, the, the first five books of the Old Testament, week, which the Hebrews call the Torah. And God's promise was he was giving them the law to keep and they would live they would further their relationship with God through the keeping of the law, beginning with the Ten Commandments and then all the other commandments that were to follow the Ten Commandments. And then, yes, according to dispensationalists, it is conditioned by obedience. If you kept the law, you were blessed by keeping the law, and your relationship with God was sound. If you did not keep the law, then your relationship with God was not sound. And so, therefore, uh, that's, uh, it was a conditional covenant. And it's important, to, as we have seen, and we'll see more in the future, that the Mosaic Covenant has been suspended until the Great Tribulation. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Then the next in time sequence is the Palestinian Covenant. Uh, I'm not sure where they got that name. Uh, it was probably a long time ago where the word Palestinian didn't mean quite the same for them as it does today. But uh, with that promise was conditional, and it, uh, God promised that the Israel, Israelites, the Hebrews, would return from exile to the promised land, and once they got there, they would enjoy some degree of divine protection from their enemies. And so that was in their return from, from exile in Babylon. And then the, uh, the, the next one was the uh, Davidic covenant, which is unconditional, and uh, that the Davidic covenant, God promised that David would have an eternal bloodline, an eternal throne, and an eternal kingdom. David was already king, but God told him that his bloodline and his throne and his kingdom would be eternal. Uh, the dispensational view says that that was unconditional and that that will be fulfilled in the future. And then the last covenant a reckoned by dispensationalists is what is called the new covenant. And uh, that's, you can see the biblical reference there. It's in Jeremiah 30, 31. And in that God promises that Israel will finally at some point in the future be sinless. They will be perfect. They will com be complete. They will no longer wander from the law that had been given to them. And it's emphatic in dispensationalism that this new covenant reckoned by uh, in but the dispensationalists, that this has no reference to the Christian church. This is strictly a Jewish promise to Jewish people. It was unconditionally offered, and it will take place in the millennium, that thousand-year period of time in the future when the earth will basically return to its, uh, its purity as enjoyed in the Garden of Eden. And that's when this will kick in. That's when Israel will finally be truly and completely uh, delivered from sin and from her enemies. Now, here's the orthodox view of the eight dispensational covenants. Orthodoxy would not object to the concepts behind the dispensationalist covenant, covenant terms, Edenic covenant or Adamic covenant, covenant or Noahic covenants. We don't use the term covenant for these things, uh, these evidence uh, events, but we would agree with the dispensationalists that God offered the blessings of Eden to Adam and Eve, and after the fall, humanity must contend with painful childbirth and frustrations in their labors. And then thirdly, God will never again destroy the earth with water. So those concepts are recognized uh, by the Orthodox. We wouldn't call them a covenant, though we, we basically would agree with the gist of what the dispensationalists are saying about them. However, Orthodox has a very different understanding of the other dispensationalist covenants. As stated before in this class, orthodoxy believes in only two dispensationalists, Old Testament, dispensations, Old Testament and New Testament. 
Orthodoxy also believes in the essential unity between Israel and the church. The church, uh, is a, uh, 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 the church is not a parallel or parenthesis of Israel, but the completion and the uh, fulfillment of, of Israel. And you can see some of the well, better known icons from uh, Orthodox, Orthodox iconography, and there are many more, more like this that recall great events in the Old Testament. Uh, we have uh, Abraham about to, to sacrifice Isaac. We see the prophet Elias or Elijah uh, rising and being taken off to heaven. We see the parting of the Red Sea. We see the three children, uh, what we call the three holy youths in the furnace in, in Babylon. So Orthodox, he basically says, there are only two covenants, the old and the new. So for us, there's not eight, there's only two. The Bible's own table of contents supports the Orthodox belief in only two covenants, old and new. The Christian Bible has the same two-part division, Old Testament and New Testament. The New Testament was written entirely in Greek, and the Greek word for testament is diatheki, which means either term, the term either means testament or covenant, means the same thing. It can be translated either way. Dispensationalist Christians own and Bibles say Old Covenant and New Covenant. It's in their own Bibles, in the original language of the New Testament. Dispensationalism sees eight covenants. Orthodoxy combines the first seven into one, and the eighth is the New, Testament, the New Covenant. Why Orthodoxy believes in only two covenants and not eight? As stated before, dispensationalists define a covenant as a covenant is an agreement or contract between men or between men and God. Generally, it is based on certain conditions agreed upon. Sometimes, as between God and man, it is unconditional. God's covenants with man originate with him and generally consist of a promise based on the fulfillment of certain conditions. God has made eight covenants with man. However, in three of dispensationalism's eight covenants, the word covenant in the Hebrew, because it's the Old Testament, now we're looking at the Bible in its original language there, in Hebrew, that word covenant is barith. In three of dispensationalism's eight dispensations, and eight covenants, excuse me, the word covenant is not used in the biblical text. The Edenic, Adamic, and Palestinian. It is not clear why the term covenant is applied to these dispensationalist covenants. Conversely, the Bible mentions many more covenants than just the eight as recognized by dispensationalists. A passage describing the arrangement of the bread of the presence in the tabernacle uses the word covenant. Every Sabbath he, the priest, shall set in order before the Lord eventually, or continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So the Bible commands this care of the bread of the presence, a covenant. Yet this is not counted on the dispensationalist of recognized covenants. Uh, another one, book, book of Leviticus, where the word covenant is used. And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Now the Bible calls salt used in the grain offering as refers to it as the salt of the covenant. Yet this is not counted on the dispensationalist list of recognized covenants. <laughs> Therefore say, behold, I give to him, Phineas, God speaking here, my covenant of peace. It shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of an everlasting priesthood because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. This is God basically blessing uh, uh, Old Testament figure named Phineas. <coughs> In this passage, God bestowed a covenant of peace upon his zealous servant Phineas, yet this is not counted on the dispensationalist of recognized covenants. <coughs> now, nearly a generation after God made his covenant with Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai, Moses said this at a completely different place called Horeb. 
And Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn of them. <clears throat> and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us. Those are here today, <clears throat> all of us who are alive. Now here Moses is drawing a, distinct, distinct, a, a clear distinction between the covenant God made at Sinai and what he calls the, gov the covenant here today. Yet this is not counted on the dispensationalist list of recognized covenants. <laughs> In addition to the covenant at Sinai and Horeb, the word covenant is used a third time by Moses, this time on, on Mo in a place called Moab. <clears throat> These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make. With the children of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. So this is the third use of the word covenant in the Old Testament that is not recognized as a covenant in dispensationalism. There's another one, Joshua 24, 25. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Dispensationalism does not consider this event, which is called a covenant, through Joshua at Shechem to be a true covenant. <laughs> to summarize, dispensationalism calls covenants events that are not called covenants in the Bible and does not, not call covenants events which are called covenants in the Bible. These inconsistencies are perplexing to Orthodox. Uh, another reason why Orthodoxy only believes in two covenants. In the book of Genesis, Abraham and his wife Sarah had been unable to conceive. So God promised them a son. After a long delay, Moses fathered a son, Ishmael, through his servant, Hagar. However, this was not the son that God had promised. Eventually, Abraham's wife conceived and gave birth to Isaac. It was through Isaac, not Ishmael, that Abraham's bloodline would be reckoned. Hagar and Ishmael were sent away. With this story in mind from the book of Genesis regarding Abraham, in the New Testament, St. Paul explains the meaning of this story to Christians. He writes in Galatians, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondswoman, the other by a free woman. But he, was, he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman according to the promise which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants. These are the two covenants. Notice this, two, not eight. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in, in bondage with all her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Now note that Paul calls Isaac and Hagar slash Ishmael the two covenants, not eight. The Orthodox Church still believes this. Paul clearly compares Hagar and Ishmael, whom God had rejected, and Abraham sent away forever to Israel. This is in sharp contrast to dispensationalist assertion that Israel is still living with Abraham and home, at Abraham's home, waiting to be restored when Isaac has been raptured. Paul explicitly contrasts the church to Jerusalem, the new, true, and final Israel, which he calls the mother of us all. So to put that, it's a lot of talk, but just to put this into an easier to understand form. According to that passage we saw, you see, um, you see the, the, the chosen one, Isaac, on the left, and you, you see Hagar and Ishmael on the right. Paul basically says that Isaac is the church and Ishmael is Israel. Israel was sent away. Israel uh, was, or, was or, or Hagar and Ishmael were not reckoned to be part of the covenant and they were dismissed. They were sent away from Abraham's household. Whereas the child of the promise, Isaac, 
was kept and wound up uh, growing and being being the uh, the inheritor of all the blessings that God had had promised to Abraham. Another reason why orthodoxy only believes in two covenants and not eight. When God made his covenant with Abraham, he instituted the sign of that covenant, which is circumcision. Here's where circumcision came from in the book of Genesis. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and that shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from a foreigner or who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with money must be circumcised. <laughs> And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So note that the sign of the covenant with Abraham is called everlasting. That means it's still present today in some form. Another scripture from the New Testament identifies the form of Old Testament circumcision as it, as it still exists today. The Apostle Paul writes, In him, he's speaking to Christians now, In him, you, Christians, were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him, through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So there still is a circumcision that is the continuation and the fulfillment of what God commanded to take place to the Hebrews in the Old Testament. And that New Testament equivalent is circumcision. On the right side, you see at the top uh, the ceremony, uh, the Jewish ceremony of the bris, where a qualified ra rabbi, uh, happens to be called the Moel, does the circumcision. And so the, the Jewish people still keep that commandment. Uh, the more the devout Jews make sure that this happens, because until that is done, uh, the baby boy may have both parents Jewish, but until that baby boy is circumcised, he is not counted as being Jewish. So that is very important to them. Likewise, you see in the bottom picture there, an Orthodox priest baptizing a child. And um, a similar age, the, a child too, too young to understand. But in the same way, generally speaking, we don't want to be too dogmatic and say this never happens. But as a general rule, um, our, our faith, our time, our entrance into the church begins at our baptisms. That is for us Christians our equivalent of circumcision, which was for them the entrance into the Old Testament covenant people of God. It is through baptism that we Christians uh, enter into the new covenant of God, which is the church. Note that the sign of the government, why did that happen? The one covenant of the new, in the dispensational scheme that is of great importance to Orthodox is the new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. This is the new covenant, covenant uh, cited in Jeremiah 
of which the dispensationalists and the, and the Orthodox, uh, particularly the Orthodox, pay a lot of attention to. Orthodoxy firmly believes that this new covenant is being fulfilled here and now in the Orthodox Church, not in a future Jewish millennium as the dispensationalists believe. The writer to the Hebrews writes about the new covenant foretold by Jeremiah. So we've already had biblical New Testament commentary on this particular new covenant from Jeremiah. Uh, it says this, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. <laughs> See here, uh, the writer to the Hebrews combines all the Old Testament covenants proposed by the dispensationalists into one, which he calls the first covenant. <laughs> he also states that the first covenant was not faultless. In other words, there's something wrong with it. So the writer of the Hebrews then goes on to quote Jeremiah in detail. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them. <coughs> says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and I will sin, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So a writer in the New Testament giving definitive interpretation to what the new covenant is. Continues, after quoting the new covenant from Jeremiah, Hebrews says, uh, Hebrews says the following. <laughs> in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. This is exactly how the Orthodox see, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> This is exactly how orthodoxy sees the old and the new covenants. The old covenant was imperfect, so the new covenant made it perfect. The old covenant was obsolete, so the new covenant has replaced it. For Hebrews continues, now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now this, this was written in the first century AD the, the writer of the book of Hebrews is basically saying the Old Testament, it's obsolete and growing old and getting ready to vanish away. It's in the process of passing into history. After nearly 2,000 years, it has certainly passed away by now, this, this old covenant as being in force, as being uh, the, the pathway to God. There is no hint here that they will make a comeback in the future as predicted by dispensationalists. For the Orthodox, the fact that the New Covenant is happening now, and not sometime in the future, is made profoundly clear by Christ at the Last Supper. And this is key to Orthodox and key to dispensationalist understanding where Orthodox are coming from when it comes to the, the New Covenant. <coughs> Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you for the remission of sins. Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, using the original Greek word diathiki, which can be either termed either covenant or testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Orthodox Christians hear these words at every divine liturgy, just before the consecration of the holy gifts. And at least Orthodox, this is the ample evidence that the new covenant that has begun, it began in, the upper room, in an upper room in Jerusalem at Passover around the year 33 AD and has been in force ever since. To Orthodoxy, it is bewildering why dispensationalists would ignore this obvious link between the new covenant as foretold by Jeremiah and its fulfillment by these words of Christ himself. So this concludes the class. <coughs> I'll leave this up.
for a few minutes. So I in, encourage you to uh, send me an email. Uh, I invite your comments. And if I can, if I'm not overwhelmed, I'll be happy to attempt to answer your questions. Uh, thank you for participating and we will look forward to seeing you again uh, in, the, in the future.